We're glad you're watching Morning Express on this Tuesday, the 25th of November. It is now 7.17 a.m. It is time for Person of Interest. This morning, I'm joined in studio by the Devolution and Planning Cabinet Secretary, Anne Waiguru. We'll have our phone lines uh, screening on the bottom end of your screen. You can call in and be part of the conversation this morning. You can tweet us as well and engage with the CS directly. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sophia, for having um, me. Let's start with the, the biometric registration recently concluded and you came out and gave the results from that exercise. So about 12,500 ghost workers that were found and um, millions of shillings that are said to be saved from this particular exercise. Talk to us about the significance of these numbers that we're hearing about. Um, Sophia, maybe I should start by saying the biometric <laughs> exercise was not an end in itself. It okay. was not uh, the main activity that we've been carrying out. We've been carrying out an overall capacity assessment and rationalization program, right. which the biometric was just one of the things that we were doing. Now, the reason we were doing the biometric wasn't really to catch the ghost workers, but to establish our capacities in the public service. Who are we? How many are we? Um, what qualifications do we have? Mm -hmm. Where are we placed? Uh, which qualifications are where? Are we aligning our capacities with the results that we want? That was really the objective around the uh, capacity assessment exercise. And then one of the things that we did was a biometric exercise. Now, the second thing is that um, we had 12,500 no-shows. That does not necessarily mean that all of them are okay. ghost workers. Okay. Many of them could be, but it's not a guarantee that each one of them is, because um, there could be reasons. As you've had, some people just didn't come because they didn't have uh, documentation. We're waiting to see. Uh, there are others maybe who are out of the country. But a majority of those people who did not show up are suspect. Um, there is also uh, some of those that have um, been listed amongst the 12,000 mm -hmm. that we've discovered have actually been fraudulently, with, with evidence, um, defrauding the public service. And um, those to answer now your question on what is the way forward, for those individuals and those names that we have, we have actually given quite a number to the CID and okay. as you heard last week, the cabinet approved for an investigation to commence. All right, so first, there is still room for those who are not able for one reason or another uh, to still come back and have their biometrics taken. Yes, if there is a good reason. If there is a good reason. Yes. And that the others will be investigated. Yes. So that number then could go significantly down. Maybe not. Maybe up. Maybe up? Yeah. Because okay. um, you see also, as you, it was an interim report right? And um, in the interim report, we have uh, come, uh, discovered that we have quite a number of new recruits in the last one year. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a significant number, over 30,000. Now, um, you also need to verify that. Um, who's, who has hired them, where they um, hired and why, and that could affect the numbers either way. So, uh, our suspicion is that it could go either way. Mm -hmm. The numbers could go slightly lower, but could also go higher because right. we're still continuing with the exercise. I should mention again, as you had, it's not an exercise carried out by my ministry only. It was a joint exercise uh, between the national and county government and all the independent institutions that deal with the human resource issues uh, within the public service. Okay. Public Service Commission was there. You saw that SRC, um, CIC, because of the constitutional matters, CRA, TA is also part of it. So it was a joint exercise uh, within an intergovernmental framework. All right, so you say it continues. When does it restart? We, we actually are moving on now. They are in the process of doing forensic uh, analysis. They are, they are actually studying the, the data, mm -hmm. analyzing uh, what it means, the numbers, because it's not just about 12,000. It's now what do these numbers mean for us, and then what are the policy decisions that we can make out of these numbers. Mm -hmm. And so we've, um, we are expecting to completely close that exercise uh, of the capacity assessment towards end of February. And then once we're done with that, we will now comments on another exercise. We're expanding the exercise to the other arms of the public service. You know that the civil service is just one small portion of the mm -hmm. public service. We mm -hmm. have the disciplined forces. We have the teachers as well. We would like them to also go through the same exercise. Okay. So it's, it's going to be a long-term um, assignment. Assignment. Really. So during uh, the exercise, and when it began, in essence, many voices came out to opposed to it, saying it was a witch hand. As we speak, the Kenya County Government Workers Union, the general uh, 
Commerce Secretary Robert Duba had threatened to move to court, saying that in fact even these results are out of an illegal process because there was an industrial court order uh, barring that the exercise continue pending the hearing of some of the cases that had been applied. What do you say to that? Well, there was an, uh, a, a court action against certain counties. It was not nationwide. Blanket. Okay. Yes. And um, by the time they were going to court, because they were going to court after the exercise had long started, most of those counties had actually finished um, their exercise. So you wouldn't quite say it's illegal because we continued with the other counties that were not affected. Okay. Uh, for example, the, there had been a court case in Nairobi and it was lifted. So there was no violation at all. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah. Yeah. What do you say when you hear the likes of Kotu boss had been come out initially very opposed to the exercise? It's unfortunate, really, and it was very premature, if you ask me. Yeah. I think um, many times in in public service, we tend to start politicizing processes that we're not even sure what um, they are out to do. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see the national government and the county government jointly carrying out an exercise with all the independent arms that are outlined in the Constitution, the Commission of Implementation of the Constitution, CRA, TA, Public Service Commission, SRC, doing one thing, you should ask yourself twice. I mean, why would you be the one on the other side? You know? Mm -hmm. The second thing is that even the union of public service was with that as a technical level. They're part of the exercise. So I think it was very premature, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen since then they've been quiet, so probably they realized that there was really nothing to worry about. Yeah. In terms of the money that's being saved from this um, exercise, you know, being able to reveal that they are ghost workers, people taking home money that they shouldn't, how much is it? Well, again, as I said, these are the things that we are certaining. Uh, I can't say for a fact That's how much, but if you took an, a rough estimate of maybe 20, 30, 30,000 shillings, let's say um, you say that an officer was earning 30 together with allowances maybe 35 or 40, mm -hmm. and you multiply by the number, you'll, you'll say approximately 400, but you can't quite say 400, 500 million, you'd need to actually get the figures to see how much that money is. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's shift gears to um, the Huduma Centers, and you were awarded uh, ICT in leadership, and the Ministry as well recognized uh, for using ICT. Um, what drives your use for ICT, for having it integrated in your, some of your projects? I think maybe it's just um, my interest in public service reform. I've always yeah. been in public service reform. I have seen the challenges that we face in the public service, the um, issues that we deal with with regard to inefficiencies, mm -hmm. and um, ICT is just one of those tools that makes us more effective. Um, the world has changed. Um, ICT is part and parcel of us. We never used to have um, iPads, for example. Now we can't do anything without them. Um, technology has advanced, and I think the public service also needs to move with the times and um, adjust to be more efficient and also to respond to the needs of the people that we serve, majority of who are young people right. who are technologically advanced and therefore we must um, conform. So really, I have a personal interest myself. I've always been driving systems in government. But other than that, is besides just being a personal interest for everybody in public service, is something that we ought to embrace. Yeah. Duma centers, several now open. Is it 13 around the country? 14, 14. and another 10 before Christmas. Before Christmas. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a lot of activity and there's a lot of campaign to just get everybody sensitized and knowing about them. Um, how are they doing now in terms of some of the progress and challenges as well you faced in implementing of this project? Um, let me start with the good things. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Huduma Centers have transformed the way we view the public service. Mm -hmm. I think when we started, um, there was a lot of doubt whether we can achieve this because in the public service, we were used to a silo mentality of service delivery. If you need an item from the Ministry of Lands, you go to the Ministry of Lands. Um, if you need to register your business, you go to the AG's uh, office. Right. If you want to get a birth certificate, you go to the um, birth and registration office. If you need a passport or an ID, you go to the relevant offices and you go wherever that is. So I think what it has done for us is that it has 
demonstrated to us that, mm -hmm. first of all, the public service has changed. Uh, two, this government is very committed to ensure that we are changing the way we do business in the public service and having a one government approach, mm. whole government approach. Um, if one of us falls, we all fall. If one of us does very well, we are all celebrating yeah, yeah. because that's how it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to have, you're not supposed to have one department that's extremely efficient and another one that is extremely inefficient and in the same government. So that's, that's one thing. And I think that is something that we should celebrate. And I think that's one of the successes of the Huduma Centers, demonstrating that we can deliver government services from one center with the same quality of service without corruption and efficiently and with um, the best customer service care that we can have. Right. Um, that, that's a good thing. Now, challenges, it's, it's, it's a change. So there are those that will resist it. Mm -hmm. We are still, once in a while, we do very well, and then someone pulls one of those and, <laughs> and is trying to pull you back to almost going back to the silo mentality, but we keep pushing. Yeah. Um, also, technology has been a challenge. We haven't completely um, put up a system that we should be able to interlink all Huduma Centers as we should be, as they should be, but we have done very well for, for where we are at. Um, the other challenges of... Um, training in service delivery and ensuring same standards across the country. That's difficult um, to have the exact same standard in Kisumu, in Kakamega, in Eldoret, mm. in Nairobi. Um, now we're going to be opening in Wajir. So you can imagine exactly the same standard. That's, that's what we ask for, exactly the same. The same smile at the door, uh, the same politeness. People sit down when they're queuing. They follow a number, no jumping of the queues. I mean, having those standards is it's not been very easy but we're we're doing not too badly right yeah yeah because technology a big issue especially for the far-flung areas mm -hmm. um and also just getting everybody just uh, accustomed to this accepting it being the new way of doing business that's the digital government mm -hmm. uh but uh, for many it's still a, a, an accustomation that is required it's still getting used to the whole idea so in as far as, as especially when you say that one center and the other you still do not have those linkages how long is that going to take to make that possible we we are going to we're working to make sure that happens in the next six months that I know that the team are working night and day to make sure that at least that happens okay. and as we increase the numbers to make sure that they're all fully interlinked they are interlinked in certain aspects they're not fully, not fully interlinked because what we need to do is actually link to the back offices um, you need to have um, the desk at the Ministry of the desk that provides, for example, franking of, of um, land documents to be linked to the back office in the Ministry of Lands. So it's not just about the Huduma centers being linked to each other, but also linking with their own back offices mm. and having a single system that can do that. Now, the process is started. They, we're working very hard to ensure that happens. That, that should happen in the next six to 12 months, but okay. they're, they're working on it. All right. NYS, uh, those ads, I remember seeing them and thinking to myself, wow, this is glossy, this is good. Um, talk to us about what informed it initially, just to relaunch, to revamp, to get this new face for NYS. Um, we are the ministry responsible for youth matters. Right. I have been in government for the last about 10 years. And during that time, despite what we did, we never quite were able to address the challenges that face the youth people. Mm -hmm. And um, looking at where we were coming from, then looking at the promise of the Jubilee government in their manifesto, where they committed to, to have a transformed youth in the country, we had to think very hard to come up with a program that will be a catalyst in the transformation of the youth of this country. And um, transformation in all ways, making them uh, self-reliant, uh, giving them the skills to get employment mm -hmm. so that there's youth empowerment on one side, but also on the resocialization side. Um, getting us to ask ourselves who we are as Kenyans. Uh, what is it that we stand for? Can we say there's one thing that unifies us? Um, what are our values? Do we really prescribe to the values that are in the Constitution? Mm -hmm. So those are the things that drove us to come up with that program, the new program for the National Youth Service. Yeah. 
we've just talked about uh, the ICT angle and the element of technology, but a lot of what we are seeing and hearing these young people being incorporated into and what they'll be involved in is anything but technological. It's a lot of uh, mkono, kazi ya mkono. Is that correct? <laughs> no, in, in fact, I always say we are all KYMs, <laughs> even <laughs> us. Yeah, we, we all are. Yeah. Um, I, and I think that is one thing that we want to inculcate. The reason why you see them out there, that's not all they do. Okay. I think that's what you will be seeing, but that's not what, that's not all they do. Mm -hmm. We start with what we call the paramilitary training. Right. And in the paramilitary training, they have about four, four months of going through the discipline, the marching, the um, regimentation, um, the normal things that they do. And I need to clarify here that they don't use arms in the military. Yeah, because I was going to ask, that sounds... Uh... <laughs> they're, not, they're not taught to use arms and all, they okay. use spades. You All know, right. that's, that's our tool of trade. We have spades. But they go through the rigor of discipline because you're getting people from very different, diverse backgrounds, uh, different upbringings. Now, to bring them together in a service, mm. because this is a disciplined service, there's um, a process of uh, what we call the paramilitary training. Right. Now, after you finish the paramilitary training, then you go for the national service. And that's what you see, the Kazia Mkono. And I think it's a good thing. It's something that we ought to be proud, proud of. As I said, all of us, uh, what we are in one way or other, mm -hmm. uh, we are. We are technocrats. We our work is to actually sit down in the office and do some work. And the reason we do that is to inculcate um, culture of servitude. It's national service. Mm -hmm. We need to go back to a place where you serve your country. We all to give back to our country and maybe when we start doing that we will st stop doing many things that we do that um, uh, many of us complain about but yeah. we always wonder how can we change for example literally dropping papers mm -hmm. through the window for mm -hmm. I mean small things like that you don't find that in Rwanda you know, if you very go to, clean. yeah, it's a very clean country. And other countries as well. Uh, Singapore has also perfected the art of ensuring that we're disciplined enough in the very little things. How do you do that? People have to learn to serve their country and also know what it means to pick up that paper so that you have a culture within you of ensuring that you're making work easier for the other person. Um, so the cleanup exercise, for example, in the slum upgrading program is just 10% of even what they do in the national service. So in the national service, there are many other activities. Slum upgrading is just one, one thing. Aspect. The reason why it has a lot of focus, maybe it's because it's Kebara. And maybe because it has, we've, we've done it in a, in a huge way mm -hmm. and at once. But it's just one activity amongst like seven others. There's going to be, and there is ongoing, uh, water pan and dam construction, for example. There's road construction. There is vector control um, for malaria and cessa flies. There is um, centers that will be dealing with um, working with uh, drug rehabilitation for, for the youth in certain areas. Mm -hmm. um, we are also working to build dikes. Um, we have uh, soup kitchens in, in areas where uh, either there is hunger um, or drought right. and we need to support maybe school going children. Mm. So there's quite a number of, of programs. There is going to be traffic marshals. I'm sure you know that. Yes, yes. We've announced that there's going to be provision of security. So slum upgrading is just one of the activities that you engage the youth. Mm. Um, and after they've done that, by the way, they only do it for about four, four months and then now they go back to class. Okay. And when they go to class, they're in class for two years, three years, depending on your course. If you're doing engineering, three years. If you're doing tailoring, eight months. If you're doing um, security or agriculture services, depending on how long your course is. Mm. So the National Youth Service is a training institution as well. So they only do four months of service and then go to class. Yeah. yeah. Because one would argue, especially for the target group, which is the youth, most of them would be perhaps averse to KYM kind of work. They want the technology. They want these things that are very easy, fast stuck. Um, you know, generation it has been described. So do you think in the long run this will work and still continue to appeal to the young people in terms of getting involved and doing these various activities you've highlighted? I, th I think, in my view, it's working. Uh, we just uh, finished recruiting the youth this month, mm -hmm. the, the new cohorts. We increased the numbers from about 2,000 previously to now 10,000. Right. And we got the 10,000. In fact, that we can't meet the demand that we, we have. So 
is there going to be an interest? Certainly there's going to be an interest because okay. this is a four month period and, and another four months, eight months of paramilitary and the national service. After that, the government educates you for free. Okay. And trains you and in the process of doing that also works very hard to ensure you're placed after that. So I, I think it's a small price to pay if you ask me. Yeah. And, and, and also serving not just the need of the youth but also the national um, national service. Yeah, the right. advert that ran uh, appeared to be perhaps appealing more to the youth in Nairobi. Is it having the same impact to the others in um, other regions in the country? It has actually. You, has. you would be amazed. Um, the youth have a common language. I'm, I'm sure you know that. If yeah. you, when we were doing um, designing what kind of advert would you put out there, we actually looked at what it is that influences the youth. For example, the kind of music that they listen to yes. is similar, regardless of whether you're urban or you're rural. Okay. Uh, they have a, a certain language that they speak. It's a common thread. Yeah, and there are certain things that appeal to them. Okay. And, and in our view, the only thing is that um, maybe the viewership was not completely national, but where it was not, we tried as much as possible to reach through radio and to also reach through other uh, media such as uh, the, the newspaper, the print media, and then also word of mouth and using the communities as well. So how long is one in this program for NYS? from the time they get enrolled, you've talked about the four months, they'll get into the activities and they school. Yeah. So approximately how long is it? Three to four years. Three to four years. Yeah. And the ages? That's why we, we ask that we take up to 22 mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of them want to use as an entry to other disciplined forces such as the um, KDF or, um, or the police and um, if you come in when you're very old first of all it will be difficult for you to go through the paramilitary yeah. and then also um, after you're done it's, it's not easy to transition to the other levels of either education or, or recruitment so if you want to join KDF you're still within the age range that they would require and if not and you want to now advance your diploma to a degree mm -hmm. you're still young enough to do that so that's that's what we do we provide um an avenue and an entry point for those who had actually been left out by by the system yeah and politics has not escaped this particular project um the president has been there i think it's a two occasions in in kibera and um so there are those that have argued that the president in focusing on this and having a ministry begin with kibera is really to perhaps play that quick political card that uh, the Jubilee government in two years has been able to do what Laila Odinga, who was the member of parliament for two decades there, was not able to do. Is there that inspiration behind perhaps the beginning with Kibera? I, I wouldn't say that was our motivation, mm -hmm. but I cannot um, control perception. The only thing I say is that there's no government that gets into office with the objective of anything other than demonstrating that they can deliver. And so I think in everything that we do, and not just for Kibera, mm -hmm. in everything that we do, whether it's with my centers, we are demonstrating that we are achieving where other people fail. I think that is important. It's an important message. Uh, it's not our driving force, but you have to actually meet certain expectations. And most people change governments because they want you to do something that the previous government did not do. That's why usually there is a change, right? So I wouldn't say that that was our motivation, but I would not rule out the uh, outcome if that happens or the interpretation politically because everyone sees things um, a, a bit differently. Um, this is Kebara. We're doing Kebara. We are are also going to be in another five slums in another month. Okay. So, yeah. It's not just about Kibera. So, I don't know what they will say when we go to the other so ones, but we, we take it in our stride and continue focusing. There were reports that there was some resistance as well. The thing that this is spearheaded by the president, who seemed to be a political enemy of who was their leader and is still very popular there, that is Raila. Is it correct? Doing your work there, there was some resistance? No. I think the people of Kibera are, are very different from what we we read or see outside yeah. in the political arena. They are very, very diligent people, people who 
have been longing for certain services for a very long time. We're doing very simple things with NYS, as you said. It, we're doing a lot of kazi amkono, really. And, um, and if that is going to transform and make their lives better, um, I, I think that yeah, is what accepting. we would want to, to do for them. And they are very accept, mm -hmm. acceptable. We have um, recruited about 3,000 youth in this exercise. Right. They are working together with our servicemen and women. And so inculcating the same values that we're getting at NYS um, with our youth, hard work. Um, the, the good news, I should tell you, uh, we were given this report by the OCPD of Kilimani, mm -hmm. that in that area, security, insecurity has gone down by over 70%. Oh. I mean, if that happens, because we're in Kibera, so be it. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's a good motivation for us. I think um, we focus on what it is that we really wanted to do. We are giving this youth a hope. Uh, for every um, 500 shillings they earn, we save for them 30%. Mm -hmm. Out of that 30%, they will be settled in an enterprise in probably in another month or so. We hope they'll be able to sustain those enterprises, giving them a livelihood, ensuring that they have a decent uh, living standard, decent right. because it's, a, it's actually a requirement in the Constitution that we should provide a clean environment. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, have rights to have... Um, uh, water and sanitation to the standards that you and I have, yes. uh, regardless of how how well off or, or not they are. So for us, we are looking at ensuring that we are meeting the objectives of a government in a holistic manner. So it is the government's responsibility to provide these services to its people everywhere. Across the board. Yes. All right. Cabinet mm -hmm. Secretary Devolution and Planning Anwar Guru with us this morning. She's a person of interest. We'll take a short break. We'll continue the discussion shortly. Good morning. We're glad you're watching Morning Express on this Tuesday. The person of interest in studio with me is the Devolution and Planning Cabinet Secretary, Ann Waiguru. We've talked about a couple of issues and uh, we also want to go through some of your feedback. We thank you for the tweets that are coming through. And remember, our phone lines on your screen. Call in and engage uh, the CS uh, this morning. Before we move away from Kibera and some of the work you've been doing there, uh, a quick one. The former Prime Minister was there recently as well. And he said that what is being done now is simply building on his brainchild. That this was, in essence, his idea, his work, and that it was actually the president then who had perhaps not facilitated him to be able to implement some of this work. What do you say to that? Uh, I don't think that was accurate. Yeah. I don't think so. Um, we designed this program. Uh, from scratch. It had absolutely nothing to do with him uh, in that sense. Um, we're, not, we're not doing, as I said, uh, very big things. We're doing very simple manual, uh, manual things. We are cleaning, um, cleaning sewers, building the sewer system and building toilets. Mm -hmm. And then we have very interesting initiatives, um, which you will see soon, uh, which have very similar mirrored to the economic stimulus program that we had done previously in, in National Treasury. So I wouldn't say that is entirely accurate. Accurate. Yeah. All right. Some feedback. Um, a lot of people here in support of your work you have Isaac who's saying, Hongera, Madam Waiguru, these people don't know how exhausting it is to flash out ghosts. Uh, he says, cheers. Philippa Rutera says, Waiguru is the best minister Kenya has had since independence. May the Lord bless her. Yeah, Sylvester keep props saying congratulations for Huduma Centers, but in company registration, you only do 1% of name search of all the process. Please improve. What do you say to that? I don't understand about 1% yes. of the name search. I yeah. think we do everything, unless uh, someone didn't quite inform him, but we'll check, You'll check. see, see what, what he means. Okay. Mm. Fadisia is saying, furthermore than flashing out 12,500 workers, deserves a medal. Okay. That is another great supporter of yours. Why should the Iron Lady be counted? She's doing a great job is another uh, message. Um, Winsy Joseph says, good morning. I love her for she knows her work. A huge, okay, you have a lot of supporters. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's encouraging. Um, although there's one who's saying you refuse to attend a devolution conference in Kuali. That's, that's St. Elmo's fire. Refused. Is it? No, that was that. You remember that story. Um, 
Ah, and, and I made it very clear. <laughs> we viewed it as an internal county government reflection exercise. Mm -hmm. We had our own um, in, internal reflection exercise for the national government. And thereafter, there's been a devolution conference that the national government participated in. So I think, again, as I said, it's unfortunate sometimes we over-politicize issues in this country, yeah. but we didn't refuse to go. Not we cannot to refuse to go for, for a conference. Okay. No. We have a caller on the line before we continue on the messages here. Um, Getonga, good morning. Good morning to you. How are you? Thanks for calling. Yes, mine is a comment, huh? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I want to congratulate my sister, Anna Iguru. Mm -hmm. She has achieved so much in the last one year. If we talk of Uduma, if we talk of Ghost mm -hmm. if we talk of Wanawa, yes, huh? And uh, currently, if you look at uh, her ministry, devolution is not an easy ministry. And uh, if you look at even the politics going around the uh, devolution, and uh, you see how well she works with the uh, governor, huh? that is the ultimate yardstick that leadership is measured. Then we are very, very proud. Of. My, myself, I'm my youth, and uh, for once, I never used to think that we can find somebody who is so efficient, somebody who can produce results. I want to encourage her, and only we keep on praying for her. I'm a youth, and we are very, very proud of her. I just want to tell her that God will bless her abundantly for working for Kenya. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Gitonga, for calling. Uh, some encouragement there as well. You're doing a good job. Um, there's another question here. Uh, Cobbs Mugira says, the government is killing devolution. And this is not the first time you've had this. There are many who've held the view that there are those in government that are out to ensure this does not work as the drafters of the Constitution envisioned it would. Where do you think those who feel that are getting that idea from? I think I've said it before. I think that that statement about the national government killing devolution is actually a tired accusation. <laughs> it's, it's tired. Some are still tired. It. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think some people just say some things because um, they want to say something negative. I mean, how? How is the national government killing devolution? More money that perhaps uh, the counties have been pushing for, even with the governor's push for Pesa Mashinani. Are they starved of cash? It's a very simple response to that. Money is never enough. Ministries, if you look at the ministry's requests, they never get 90% of what they ask for. It's just that the ministers now don't go shouting, saying that I have been denied resources mm -hmm. and therefore. And it's been like that forever because we have scarce resources and we need to allocate them mm -hmm. um, according to the various needs. The second thing that I would want to say is that uh, money is not given in a vacuum. Yes. Money, uh, resources follow functions. So you're given resources to carry out the functions that you have been given. The resources that the county government have been given were aligned to the functions that the county governments have. If you look at the constitution, schedule four, you will see about 13 to 15 functions that have been given to the county government. If you look at the national government list, it's about 44 functions. Mm -hmm. And then the constitution further goes to say, any function not listed belongs to the national government. So when you look at the uh, distribution of resources, you should also look at it in that, in that context. Yeah. The final thing is, before devolution came, these functions were being carried out. And there was an exercise that was carried out initially by the National Treasury mm -hmm. to determine what is the amount of money that you should give to the counties for them to be able to handle uh, those functions. There's, there's been challenges, of course, in the first one year where, and I'm sure you've seen that, the Auditor mm -hmm. General has raised those concerns. Right. But we knew that in the first year there would be challenges. And so what we're doing is working with county governments to do their budgeting better to ensure they're realigning the resources to the functions. And that is an exercise that is actually not as simple 
as anybody would just want to imagine. It's actually a very technical exercise. That's why you have budget and finance officers who sit down and do those calculations of how much goes to the recurrent, how much goes to development expenditure, how much do you give to health, right. in what area of health do you finance, what is it that you can do as an individual county, what is it that you should do for as a joint and what is it that you should do in collaboration with the national government. So there are very many conversations ongoing. So yes, there will always be, and by the way, it doesn't matter how much money you give, there will always be a call for more resources. But do you think we, there's merit in their call now for more resources to amend especially the constitution? I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't think so. I think it's uncalled for. Um, the constitution, when they placed the 15% minimum, they had a reason for doing that. In the first year, we gave 32 percent in the second year we've given over 40 but out of out outdated uh, records no it you would not call them outdated because this is the first time actually this year because i know they are finally finishing their accounts mm -hmm. that this country has had current audited reports so even when they were writing the constitution they knew that our audited reports are always delayed two to three years. And don't forget I was in the Treasury, so I'm, I'm aware of how late they used to be. And anyone who's been in this government or in the previous parliament knows that we never had current records. However, we are informed that they are almost done with the current mm -hmm. um, audits, and so therefore the next allocation should be maybe um, uh, pegged to the current, current books if parliament finalizes with them. Right. But having said that, I don't think that is really the issue. I think we need to sit back and ask ourselves, what are we asking for money for? And then not all counties are uniform, if I should say that. You see, there is a general call to increase resources, but we need to ask ourselves, who actually requires resources? Because you can't say that there are some counties that may require extra resources because of one need or other. Mm. But I would not necessarily say it's a blanket, then when you get the resources divided equally um, to, to those counties. So I think, I think the issue of the amendment to the constitutional referendum is uncalled for and premature at this point in time. Because before we talk to Wycliffe, I know who's on the line very quickly and the same, the argument would be the fact that Jubilee government has gone ahead to give more money is because that 15%, even in the government, it's not sufficient. So why then not have that figure in the constitution written and there clear on pen and paper that it is a higher threshold than it stands at now? Because you already feel that 15% is not enough. I think there was a reason for that. You know, you cannot write everything in the Constitution. You can't, because then you bind yourself to a situation where you are inflexible. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. The Constitution provides that um, two uh, between a county and a nas the national government can agree to transfer functions. So in, in a certain county, the national government can decide to give certain functions that we carry out yes. to that county government, right? What happens when that process starts happening? Because there are 47 counties, so you will have different agreements with different counties depending on um, what it is that you have agreed between that county. Sometimes counties will come and say take over functions. You've seen what is happening even with Makoeni. They're saying dissolve it. I mean, what happens in that situation? I think not everything is supposed to be pegged in the constitution okay. in terms of numbers and figures. The, the, the constitution is supposed to provide the overall principles. Some and direction. Uh, yes, uh, and then within that framework and the environment, then you make certain decisions in um, collaboration okay. and in the spirit of cooperation. That's what it provides for. All right. Wycliffe, we still have you on the line. Good morning. Yes, yes. Thank you uh, for calling. What's your contribution? Okay. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, Honorable Waiguru yes. for the good work he's done. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, my question to her is that uh, on the CAP project that uh, just concluded where she got the ghost workers, yes, some of us were employed uh, in 2011 as uh, diploma holders, uh, and we proceeded to pursue our bachelors, and we are through with them, and others have even proceeded and done masters and they were employed at diploma level. To this extent, they have not got any increments in their sleeps. And uh, I'm asking, do you think uh, CAP's program would be an answer to this and uh, should we keep hoping? Secondly, uh, I wanted to congratulate her on the Huduma issue and uh, add, add her to, to keep scaling it up to places like Homa Bay where we work, and we may want to, to do other things that others are doing with the Huduma. All right, Wycliffe, thank you. 
He had a, a question on the qualifications, educational background, yes. Some time back, um, a policy was passed in, mm. in government that uh, if, uh, to encourage people to go back to school, that if they got certain qualifications, then you automatically get a promotion. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that is where he's, he's coming from because they entered as diploma and then finally they've gotten degrees, but nothing really seems to have changed. Um, this is an issue that is being reviewed right now. Um, mm -hmm. It is not really a mandate of my ministry. It's actually a mandate of the Public Service Commission because mm -hmm. they have been given that mandate by the, um, by the Constitution. And I think they will be communicating um, what the direction is. But I, I think the issue of promotion um, the issue of um, increase in salary will be guided by whatever framework uh, the Public Service Commission agrees with all the relevant uh, institutions they're supposed to consult with. So I think I would just ask them to be a little bit patient. I think that's work yeah. in progress, almost done. So we'll wait to hear what the Public Service Commission says. Yeah. yeah. Um, some of the counties, we've had uh, governors uh, talk about this, wanting roads to be devolved. Um, and, uh, you know, it, there's been a perception that perhaps that would not happen because of the nature of the kind of tenders that go into these roads. And uh, your thoughts in as far as roads and which trunks especially, there are different associations and groupings in as far as the roads and their categories. Do you think that is a way that perhaps should be explored going forward? This is, this is a very interesting and... Um, <laughs> It's a very interesting question, yeah. mostly because um, the roads issue is one of those issues that is really under negotiation right now. Okay. It's in court. Um, the uh, county governments have gone to court on the interpretation. I think twice we've be, they've been sent back to um, have a discussion with the national government, mm -hmm. which we are facilitating. And so I wouldn't have an opinion one way or other. I think we'd wait for the outcome of that um, consultation to um, to be concluded. I mm -hmm. think the issue is not whether roads should be devolved, because roads are devolved, is which roads are devolved, because the, it was not very clear what, what that meant, which, which roads. It seems like there are different interpretations, and I think that's why they had gone to court. Yeah. I, would, I would rather wait until the outcome of either the court or the negotiation, settlement outside court, or um, because that's what the Constitution actually re required, mm -hmm. is a law to be passed, what the law would say with regard to specifically which roads. But they, I think all of us agree that it's not as simple as we had this imagined. People had thought you just say this classification belongs to counties and this classification belongs to the national government. But when you look at it in the national context, a certain classification of road in a certain region, like the marginalized region, means very different from that same classification in, mm -hmm. in another region that is more advanced. And when those complexities have come, I think that's why they've been the issue of going back to court and, and coming okay, out to, uh, to negotiate. I'd rather wait until uh, either the bill passes or um, the court determines or we between the national government and county government settle it uh, amicably. All right. Yeah. Moses Mwangi is on the line from Eldoret. Moses, good morning. Good morning, Madam Sophia. Thanks for calling. Go ahead with your contribution. I'm very glad to you host Madam Yes. Mm -hmm. Um I'm one of the youth in Kenya who believe that Rio Kazium Kono Tundi Tamaliza E and Employment Javidana. Hello. Yes, we hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, so just tell her to keep on, on the good work and try to encourage you to take up the challenge. Easy because it's a kono simba and important. <laughs> All right. Thank you, uh, Mwangi, for calling. Welcome, welcome. Before we go back to some of those um, functions and whether the ones being called for devolution should, those that I have, whether it's working, the state of devolution in general, as you see it, from where you see it, is it succeeding? Is it achieving what it was set out to? I think in the overall, if you look in terms of absolute numbers, mm -hmm. 47 counties, majority of them are functioning. Um, we've had teething problems, but uh, many have picked up and are doing pretty well. Uh, not excellent, but pretty well. I think devolution is working in that, in that sense. Are there challenges? Every day. Mm. I think in the recent past, more than any other time, we have seen a lot of conflicts between the various institutions. And right. I think that's a very serious issue of concern. Um, with the latest now with regard to 
um, the uh, county of, of Narok. I think um, Makweni again has been, before that was Embu. I think this is, that, that concerns us. That, that concerns us. As much as it's, um, it's expected to a certain degree, it's not, um, it's not a trend that we would want to see continuing. Uh, previously was a, quite a number of court cases and, um, and um, impeachment attempts of um, the county executive, yeah. either the, the governor or the county executive members. Then again, it swinged to um, now the speakers in the county assembly. Now we are seeing again a situation where we are now getting the public involved in this, um, in this issue. And we are seriously looking to see what is happening um, I think we need a very serious conversation. Yeah. This is where now that conference uh, really would come in handy, where you have all the institutions that were mandated to safeguard devolution coming together and asking ourselves very serious questions. What is it that we, what are the assumptions that we made that are not working um, or were not accurate? What is it that we need to start amending? What kind of education do we need to give? My, my ministry is going to be undertaking civic education out there because I, I think a lot of the times also a lack of information um, right, yeah. on what to expect of county governments. How do you hold them accountable? What do you do when you're aggrieved? Is, is every mistake a mistake of get out of office? Mm -hmm. uh, or is it, is it correctable? I mean, those, those are some of the things that we need to ask ourselves because um, if this trend continues, if tomorrow you have another five counties going in that route, I think it would be a very unfortunate situation. Yeah. And it's not a situation any, anybody would want to see. Not us in the national government and not those in the county governments as well. And so I urge all the players who are responsible to give dialogue a chance. I think many times we overlook that this should be, a, by the time you're calling for somebody to get out of office, you should have exhausted all other mechanisms. You know, the threshold should be that you've tried everything else yeah. before we get to the place where we are completely agitating and grounding public service. And, and, I, and I say this from the public service point of view, because the reason why you have county governments and the national government is to deliver service to the Kenyan people. And for as long as there's this conflict, that gets disrupted. And, and it's in our interest and in the interest of all those who are in government to ensure that we do not disrupt public service. Yeah. Dialogue has been tried in Makueni. It's led to a near, you know, it was a gunfight. Thankfully, nobody uh, died in that incident. But they've now started on their process, have collected signatures. I believe it's now at the presidency in as far as whether this, the county should be dissolved. Do you feel they've done enough in as far as just trying to resolve their issues? to now get to the point that they want to dissolve the county and go back to the people? I wouldn't say whether, I mean, I don't think it's even important what my opinion is as an yeah. individual, whether they've done enough or not. The only thing I say is very unfortunate. That it's at that it level. Is, yes, it is extremely unfortunate that this is where we've gotten into. Sometimes we get into situations which are unfortunate. This is one of them. Um, we, I wish it was avoided. I wish it was avoided. I wish we found another solution mm -hmm. which enabled a continuous um, service delivery to the people of Makweni, for yes. example, in the, in the issue of Makweni. But if this is where it is at, that is what the democracy is about. This is um, what the constitution provided, that there should be a mechanism and a way out if there is, if all else fails. And, and um, they'll take it up from there. What I'm saying is that this should not be the trend. You know, now we've seen another one coming up. We are wondering how, how much longer can we sustain this kind of conflict? And that's why I'm saying let us give dialogue a chance. Okay. And also, we cannot always agree on everything. Um, we can't. There is a role by the way, and this is my view, for the opposition in any government. A good role, because they're supposed to check the government, because anyone left unchecked, there's a risk that they can mm -hmm. actually abuse their political power. So there is a role. Now, how to play that role is what maybe we need to seriously engage in. How do you call a county government to account if you are in the opposition or if you are um, no more citizen of that county right. or even from elsewhere. How do you hold counties to account, ensuring they deliver mm -hmm. and they adhere to the standards stipulated in the constitution and in the laws without disrupting 
public service? That is the question we should be asking ourselves. And may, maybe we need to do a little bit more, that's what I said, in civic education, so that we do less of, um, of calling, going to the extreme mm -hmm. and uh, finding a way of resolving our conflicts and our disputes. Okay. Another question here from Eric Oriku Amos. He says, uh, should we devolve security? We've had several of the governors address themselves to this issue and say that um, perhaps we are seeing this runaway in security because government is not involving them enough. The deputy president has said you don't even need to be called to the table. These are issues you just get yourself involved in. What are your thoughts? How can you devolve security? That is the question I posed to one of them. And they said perhaps have some, an officer who sits in some of these committees that determine and give directives on security matters. Because the argument is this, how do I as a governor or I as a senator just walk into this meeting of security chiefs or officers to then be part of offer contribution being that I'm the peop I'm the person with the people on the ground. So it's that they need an avenue that is perhaps captured in law uh, to be able to easily engage with those that uh, handle or manage security at the county level. I, I'm not uh, the minister for security and so I would be cautious in with this response yeah. but I will from a devolution point of view. Yes devolution. I think there are certain things that are not meant to be devolved. Because you picture that, pic mm -hmm. picture a devolved security system, you know? You know, security is supposed to be provided, we're one country, you know? We, we provide certain services uniformly across all counties, irrespective and regardless. Right. Um, on the question of participation, I think that's already provided for in law. There is um, uh, the committees where um, they sit on, on security briefings, mm -hmm. where you give your views. But ultimately, the decisions have to be channeled through the institution. You, you cannot, there are some decisions that are not taken collectively, if you ask me. You yeah. take the information, then someone needs to take a decision on what needs to be done, because it's not possible. If we can't even just agree or what happens, for example, if you, if you put such a situation and people disagree on the mode mm -hmm. of, of, of um, how you carry out that security operation for that matter. Right. So in terms of um, providing an avenue to share information, that, that is already provided for. I think there is the county um, security boards where you both have the um, county commissioners and the county governors. Mm -hmm. They sit together and, and I think uh, there is a uh, space for any other leader, and not just the leader, I think also an avenue for public participation in one way or other to share information. Right. But in terms of devolution of the security, um, security as, as it is, I, I don't think that is, uh, would be a prudent thing. And also it is not even provided for in the constitution, yeah, and constitution. there was a reason as to why security is provided nationally. Yeah. It's one of those functions that ought to be provided nationally. You can't have armies for each, each just imagine that or little police, there, there has to be one command and, and control um, center. Yeah. yeah. Um, you are not the security um, CS, mm, no. uh, but you said this earlier, that when one of you succeeds, then it's collect success. Yes. One of you fails or appears to be struggling, again, it reflects on the entire cabinet and government. What are your thoughts? Because this is a conversation that the country is now having um, in terms of security today. There are people staging demonstrations. Do you think as a cabinet, as a government, there are struggles. We've seen some of the leadership calling, at least from the opposition, uh, for you know removal of uh, the cabinet secretary in charge of that docket. Um, but f at where you sit and your performance, as you take this collective responsibility that sometimes perhaps is required in government, um, what do you think? I don't think. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't think. I think for that one, I would not comment. I think that's a very, very sensitive issue. It is. I think I wouldn't want to, to go into a personalized issue. I, th I think we all, as a country, ha are facing a serious challenge. Correct. As a country, not just um, as a cabinet. It's a challenge that we need to face together. And, um, yeah. 
and I, and I believe that uh, they are addressing the concerns the, the that challenges. have been raised. Yeah. All right. I just had to put that as no. <laughs> <laughs> so. Two hundred policies need to be um, varied to conform with the devolved reality, mm -hmm. but this has not been seen to happen. What is the stagnation? What's causing the stagnation? Which policies? In as far as the policies under devolution and what it is that is required to come into play. Um, let me just open this uh, for you. The final status of devolution in Kenya, the last amendment that was made, there were several policies that were put out to ensure that um, this then uh, ensures that there's a correlation and working relation between the national government and devolution. Okay. I don't think there's any outstanding policy as such, okay. as in a specific one. Yes. Um, we have uh, realigned various laws to the devolved structure of government. It's an ongoing exercise. Right. Um, you've had the issue of the roads is uh, gone to Parliament as well, mm -hmm. um, if that's the issue that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. And um, policies in this kind of environment and scenario will be uh, live in the sense that you don't say that we have done. There will always be an amendment to a policy because of new realities and challenges or opportunities or changes. For example, if we get into an East African Federation ETC. Mm -hmm. So um, we are working to ensure that that happens. Uh, we have reviewed the draft policy that had been done on devolution by the previous Ministry of Local Government. Yes. It's in the stage of a stakeholder consultation. Mm -hmm. And the process actually had taken quite a while because uh, it's, a, it's a huge document. And um, as you're amending it, other laws change. So again, you need to keep reviewing. Mm -hmm. It's gone through cabinet. Cabinet has approved it. So the department um, of um, devolution in my ministry is in the process of going through stakeholder engagement. Once that is passed, we should be able to have a policy that will run for a couple of years, then we'll review it. So it's going to be a general, if that's the question that they're asking. Okay. If it's in specific to that devolution policy. All right. Um, mm. Let's uh, get in some tweets as well. Uh, this, as we talk about two ways of hand, which was rolled out mm. um, early in the Jubilee administration. Uh, so Edwin Moses asks, why is the ways of hand process taking too long yet groups completed their training uh, a couple of weeks ago? Where is, where is the gentleman from? I am not sure okay. where he's from. but Because yeah. um, the man is being disbursed. That's okay. why I'm asking where. Uh -huh. Because um, Many, many countries, count, <laughs> counties, counties, constituencies have received um, their resources. I know we've dispersed about 1.1 billion already to certain groups, dispersed to the groups, as in they already have the checks. Right. I know, for example, for the Kisumu County, maybe that's where he's coming from, mm -hmm. if they were trained about a month ago. Right. We're ready to give about 190 million shillings worth of checks. So it's, it's ongoing. I, I think they just need to check with their... Um, if I could get, when, I, when I'm off, off yeah. air, exactly where we would check. But right. um, where you have qualified, because what happened is that we have, we had a huge demand. And um, the demand, of course, exceeded the supply. So there are those who applied, and not everybody will receive. But then uh, for those who have actually been um, gone through training, it means that you actually were one of those who succeeded and so they should be receiving the receiving money and there the shouldn't money. be any delay whatsoever. But what is, what is the state of Uwezo before we move on to the next question? How is it faring? It's, it's, it's faring very well. Yeah. All the constituencies from what we have seen has est have established the uh, committees, they have um, uh, done the evaluations, they have forwarded names of um, successful applicants and requested for resources uh, other than about one or two who are the new uh, constituencies like Madari, for example, because they, they, it's a new, they just went through a by-election the other day. Right. Most of them have, have actually uh, received the money into their account mm -hmm. because we've dispersed uh, about 4.5 um, billion shillings already. Mm -hmm. Many of these groups have also gone through training. And so that's why I'm saying it's just now the process of just receiving the money and making sure we did not rush the process of giving money because they needed to go through the training to know that you need to pay back. Yes. Because in the beginning, I think there had been um, a notion that maybe they will not need, be required to pay back the money. But now you needed to go through training. How do you use your money? You multiply it. How do you apply for more next year? Mm -hmm. Or how, how do you start the repayment process? So that has taken 
a bit of a time, but I should say one point about 1.1, 1 1.2 has been given already to individuals and groups. Okay. And so we are expecting the other 3.5 or so billion that is left to also be dispersed. All right, Judge mm -hmm. Kisundi, why are there still delay of salaries in the counties? They say um, is Ms. Wag ask is Ms. Waiguru able to comment on that? Which which counties? Because. Um, yeah, it's not counties, specific. yes. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say it's not a black, that I would not say is accurate. If there was um, not all. delay, you yeah. would hear it because there would be a complaint. Maybe there's just one county that has one one challenge or other. I'm not sure. Okay, I've haven't heard of. Paul it. Mutuma is asking: Is NYS in all the counties? That's the other thing. NYS is a national function, yes. so it's not it's not intended to be in all counties. So then how do people who are in these different counties get involved? If somebody is in Wajaya, Mandera, Mombasa... The recruitment is exercise uh -huh. is per constituency. It's per constituency. Everyone, every constituency gets its quota. Mm -hmm. um, and so you cannot... You, but when you get recruited, the, um, the, the reason why it's called a national service is that you, get, you mix up and then you are deployed according to the activities that are being carried out. So if you come to Kibera, for example, yeah. the servicemen are um, from everywhere mm -hmm. across the country, and that's how it's supposed to be, because it's also a tool for national cohesion. So it's not supposed to be in every, every county in terms of physical location, but we work across the, and the drives country. are in the co yeah. Actually, the man who had asked a question about the training two weeks ago, Edwin, has mm. tweeted back and says it is Nandi Hills constituency, and that he was talking about the question on uh, Uwezo Fund, the process taking too long. Yet groups had completed the training. We will check that. Okay. Mm. All right. I want us to. We've talked a lot of serious <laughs> conversations this morning, but you hold a very heavy docket, uh, planning devolution. It's huge and ministries collapse together. How do you balance all of this? The workload must be insane. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of work. But yes. uh, again, as I said, I've been in the service for quite a number of years. Okay. And even when I was in the National Treasury, we worked similar, similar hours. So it wasn't very different from what I was used to. Um, yeah, so it's busy, but yeah. um, I don't think it's... A, it's any busier than others. I think many ministries were collapsed. Um, environment is a huge ministry, for example, mm -hmm. um, in natural resources and it has forestry and water and um, other ministries also like security is also a huge, it has home affairs in it and all. So I think um, lands is also quite a huge ministry and yeah. also busy. So I, I think all of us just find a way of making sure that we keep our eyes focused. It requires us to put in very many hours, which you you accept when you're taking the job. Yeah. What is it you do downtime? How does Anne, the lady, unwind, chill, get away from all of this? Because we're used to seeing you, you know, power suit, <laughs> doing this all. <laughs> How is it you just get away from it all? Everyone needs some downtime, no? Once in a while. Yeah. Uh, once in a while. I think I just, I just, stay somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> what I do, it's not, it's not common. So I'd have to think when was yeah, the last time I took some really dance time. It. Yes, because it's, it's not an everyday thing. Yeah. But um, I read. Okay. I like reading. What are you reading now? Um, uh, the 22 Greatest Speeches. Wow. Um, I have a few friends um, who I spend a little time with, mm -hmm. have family. Um, I look, I'm not, not the immediate, I mean the people that I haven't seen for a while, once yes, in a while, the people yes. you want to just spend a little time who will not discuss anything mm -hmm. to do with government. So that, mm -hmm. that you do once in a while. Um, I love music. Yeah. Do you dance? Uh, yes. Uh, oh, yeah? <laughs> I, I can't stop myself from dancing if I hear any music, whether it's in church or, or um, out there. So, yeah, yeah but it's not, it's not an everyday <clears throat> thing. Same. We're looking forward to, to the holidays, we hope. I know. <clears throat> What's your favorite kind of music? Um, R&B gets you going. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. My director tells me we have one more call on the line that we should take before we bring this to a close. Okay. Um, good morning, <coughs> sir. Njoroga, is it? Yeah, how are you? Good. Thanks for calling. Yeah, I just want to contribute. Yes. 
I work in Aminakuru. Sorry? And Aminakuru. Uh, right. And uh, I'm, commend, I'm commending Anne for what she's doing. She's doing fantastic, and uh, that job is quite hectic. And especially at the current uh, political situation, and yet she can perform. She must be uh, quite different uh, from others that we can see. And uh, I, I'm working also with, uh, with with young people, women, and persons with disability. I took an initiative, uh, knowing that I'm in the printing industry and station and supplies for quite a long time. I look for what I can do as a person to uh, train them on uh, the procurement, 30% procurement slot that the government have given them. I'm doing it at my capacity. And all I would ask Anne is maybe to support me in one way or another. You know, sometimes when you go there, uh, they ask you where you come from, uh, whether you are from the county or you are sent by, you know, you have nothing to tell them, but... Uh, for you another... Know, so, what are you talking about, sir? Support you I'm in one way or another. Uh, the, the support are there that, not processes to uh, be uh, followed uh, that uh, everyone uh, should, in essence, follow? If every one of us said, help us in one way or the other, will then that uh, uh, not be the sorry. way to function, perhaps? Sorry? How exactly do you want her to help? To, 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 for support. When, when I'm working, uh, and I have no, uh, and I don't have people to support me in that line. Sometimes you look funny. Others would think you are all men, you know, and they are women and you. But then uh, uh, registering them, putting them into the 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 the, the, the program of a thirty percent procurement slot, helping them to look for certificates so that they can also be able to tender. Okay. Because when you are tendering. I saw that they, they, there were no women or even you uh, uh, that were tendering in the county or even the the the, the, uh, the national government. All right. Okay. So I went out and started looking for for, for empowering the, the groups so that they can look for documents that are that are needed in the tendering, assist them, train them, enlighten them that they are things of that kind. And I found that most of them even never knew that such things were happening. All right, we landed there, sir. Your point has been made. Thank you for calling. <laughs> Is there any comment you want to make? You've said quite a number of things there, including wanting some help. <laughs> no. I, I, I think um, on the 30%, yeah. generally, we, we are working to ensure that more women, more youth, and persons with disability mm. come forward. And uh, where they don't come forward, that the ministries actually take an aggressive stand mm. as you know this is already now a law uh, we're just i think waiting for the final assent and so the national government and the county government will be required to give 30 percent so the, when it becomes law because nobody wants to break the law we will even be a little bit more aggressive i'm saying we as in every individual yeah. who's responsible for giving out tenders to ensure that women and youth and persons with disability on our side as a ministry responsible for matters gender and youth we are again working very hard to uh, work with uh, various stakeholders such, mm. such as the national youth council to make sure that um we're educating and sensitizing people right. on, on, on these issues. And then also, not just sensitizing, but also holding their hand. It's, it's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, tendering in government is not just that straightforward. There's quite, as you said, you can't just any idea. Yeah. Yes, you can be youth, you can be a woman, but there's then the procurement law that we need to adhere to. So holding their hands to ensure that they are built, their capacity is built and their confidence to try. And when you try the first time and you don't get to try a second time, and yeah. if you don't succeed the second time, you try third time because that's how life is. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned the gender being in your decade before we go. This is, has been also another huge area of concern the past few yes. days. The stripping of women. Um, my dress, my choice has been a hashtag that has been trending as a woman and also just having them falling under your docket. What do you say to this trend we are seeing? Because even just the day before yesterday, it's still continuing. It's like an insane craze that has taken over. 
I, I have issued a, a statement which mm -hmm. I signed and I think um, I said it, it is unacceptable. It is completely unacceptable. Right. We are not going to sit here and watch anyone's rights be violated mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And um, I think it's important that we make this very, very clear that um, it is against the law to violate a woman's rights, regardless of what your beliefs are at a personal level. Mm -hmm. And um, with regard to the cases, recent cases of, um, of uh, gender-based uh, violence, and, um, and that's what I would, I would call it, yeah. uh, I think we need to be very cautious. Uh, tomorrow we will be starting a campaign um, which on the 16 days of activism, okay. officially launching it tomorrow. Uh, for 16 days, um, led by His Excellency the President himself, we expect to have government there. Mm -hmm. uh, with that also, we will be taking that opportunity to launch the sexual and gender-based violence policy that the government has put out. And uh, also, on, on the other side, a, sense, a very serious sensitization campaign, the He for She campaign. And this He for She, we are calling on the male gender to support the empowerment right. and the rights of the woman yeah. gender, the female gender. And um, I think um, with that we will have made our statement very clear. For those who have already um, participated in that, in that crime, I'm sure you have seen that action is being taken, but we intend to um, make the offense even a little bit more serious than, than we, we take it, so that which is not an issue or a conversation. Women ought not to go to the streets to ask for our rights to dress the way they want. I think Correct. it's within their rights to dress as, as they wish and uh, for us to restrain ourselves, whether with our views are that they, mm -hmm. they are not either close as they should be, because it's an issue of preference yeah. and how you perceive appropriate dressing, for example, may not necessarily be how, how perceive I perceive it. it. And if we start violating based on our personal preferences, I think it's, it's a very serious issue of concern. So we make our position very, very clear as a Minister for Gender. I, I am very clear that we will not tolerate yeah. any violation against anyone's right, and especially any woman or, or, or girl's rights. Yeah, because yeah. there are those men who argue, or even women who will say that, uh, that as you exercise that freedom or have that freedom, there needs to be responsibility exercise. So that as you dress a certain way, remember to be responsible. Do you agree with that, that at the end of it all, because it's that that leaves room then for others to interpret it in their own way and say that you're not being responsible and I need to help you out. Who's, who, who determines what is responsible? Correct. As I said, who mm. determines? If you look at, for example, the way I dress, I dress in a certain way. The people who look at me and don't think that I dress as conservative as I should be, for example. Then there are other people who dress differently. I mean, this is not an issue that should be subjective. It is not as an issue that should be addressed by individuals so yeah. that I look at you because some, someone else might look at even someone in a long dress and decide that that dress does not, it, it may give me a certain picture. And so therefore, you know, yeah. so I think it's a very subjective issue and I don't think it is a conversation we can have where it comes to personal preferences. And I think we need to be very cautious because the constitution has outlined the Bill of Rights and this Bill of Rights do not just apply to one gender mm. or to certain individuals or to certain people. The reason why it's written in the constitution, it's supposed to apply regardless of whether you're a woman or a man, mm -hmm. you're tall, or short, you are from one community or another. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need to do is stand by the, the Bill of Rights and ensure that we are protecting the rights of every individual, regardless. All regardless. Right. Regardless. Yes. We'll end it there. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Great pleasure talking to you this morning. Thank you. Uh, for being with us for, I think, one and a half hours. Wow. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> yeah. Santa Sana. Uh, Devolution and Planning Cabinet Secretary Anne Waiguru with us on the person of interest this morning. A lot of your feedback on Twitter, on messages and calls. Uh, we appreciate you for watching and also engaging with us this morning. And that's a wrap for the person of interest. Stay with us when we return on your health this morning. We're all about infertility. We have an amazing panel uh, coming up in the next few minutes. Don't go away.